Welcome to Football Origins. Today we'll find out how one South American country went on to win the Football World Cups by first playing what? Cricket again? Football is the most popular British exports of them all. Here at the far out, we are going to have a look at why most Commonwealth countries such as our own have failed to qualify, let alone leave a mark at the biggest tournaments of them all, the FIFA World Cup. We will do that by deep diving into the footballing history of few powerhouses of the football world. None among them are part of the Commonwealth, few among them were colonial powers in their own right. We will talk about how it all began, under what circumstances football was introduced in those countries and how, for most among them, one other sport was the centerpiece of it all. In the process, we'll get some insights on what were the key elements that contributed to the sport's popularity in these countries, as well as what was the watershed moment, and most importantly, what can India learn from them moving forward. Today, the country that we're going to talk about, their football team is best known for its playing style, Joga Bonito, or the beautiful game. This is Brazil. What if we were to tell you that the now five-time Football World Cup champion, Brazil, was among the last Latin American countries to board the football bandwagon. Although Brazil got independent at around the same time as most of Latin America, during most of the 19th century, Brazil was not the preferred choice for European immigrants. Brazil was ranked fourth on that list after United States, Argentina and Canada. There were several reasons for that, several aspects of the colonization period that still lingered around that hindered their progress as an independent country for most part of the 19th century. So we will briefly talk about its colonial history, which is our key element numero um, colonial Brazil. Well, you must be saying we have all seen Fast and Furious 5 and this guy explained how colonization took place in Brazil. Why do we need to look at it again? Well, that was Hollywood's oversimplified version of history. It was not as simple as that. For starters, Colonial Brazil had a large coastline, roughly about 1.5 times that of India's mainland. It was impossible to protect it at all times. Over the period of colonization, it saw several foreign incursions, mostly by the French. These incursions took place to steal Brazil wood, a tree that produces a red dye which was in high demand in Europe and that gave the region its name. To extract Brazil wood from the tropical rainforest, the Portuguese relied on the work of the indigenous people, who initially worked for a brief period in exchange for European goods like mirrors, scissors, knives and axes. Trinkets. At the end of the 16th century, the indigenous population in Brazil stood around only 100,000 people. As demand for Brazil wood grew, slaves, especially those brought from Africa, provided most of the workforce of the Brazilian export economy. In the centuries to follow, sugar and then coffee became Brazil's prime export. The slaves were forced to work in these sugar or coffee plantations. Unlike neighboring Spanish America, Brazil was a slave society from its outset. Years before the North American slave trade even got underway, more slaves had been brought to Brazil than would ever reach the 13 British colonies of America. An estimated 35% of all Africans captured in the Atlantic slave trade were sent to Brazil. The slave trade in Brazil would continue for nearly 200 years and last the longest of any country in the Americas. Just putting things in context, Brazil was the last country to abolish slavery in the Americas in the year 1888, that is two decades after United States and 30 years after their neighbors Argentina. We will soon have a look at how all this played a part in Brazil's demographic and how it shaped football's future in the country. At the beginning of the 19th century, during the Napoleonic Wars, the Portuguese king fled to Brazil. After Napoleon was defeated, the Portuguese resented United Kingdom's presence on their land calling for the return of the Portuguese king to restore monarchy, albeit in a constitutional sense. Eventually, in 1821, the Portuguese king went back to Portugal, handing over the empire of Brazil to his son, Prince Pedro. A year later, following a series of political events and disputes, the prince declared Brazil's independence from Portugal on 7 September 1822, establishing a constitutional monarchy of its own. Simultaneously during this time, with the opening of Brazilian ports, immigration slowly but surely started in the country. Predominantly, Portuguese immigrants made their way to Brazil. After independence from Portugal, the Brazilian Empire focused on the occupation of the provinces of southern Brazil, such as that of Sao Paulo. Most new European arrivals were sent there. It was mainly because southern Brazil had a small population, which made it more vulnerable to attacks by Argentina. By 1850, Brazil was producing half of the world's coffee. When the Dutch, the last colonial power, abolished slavery and Atlantic slave trade, the producers in Brazil resorted to either interprovincial slave trade or exploited new immigrants from Europe instead. In 1859, Kingdom of Prussia 
prohibited immigration to Brazil after they received complaints that German immigrants were being exploited in the coffee plantations of Sao Paulo. Still, between 1820 and 1876, over 350,000 immigrants entered Brazil with an average of 6,000 per year, which was way below than that of the United States and Argentina during the same period. It would be wrong to say that just forced labor in coffee plantations was the reason behind this. However, Brazil was not as sparsely populated as other countries in South America to begin with. To put things in context, Brazil's population stood at 10 million in 1872 more than five times that of Argentina during the same period. This meant that the non-Portuguese immigrants, especially the British, were not as dominant or influential in society in Brazil as they were in Argentina during that period, which meant no cricket and social clubs so far. An estimated 14,000 British immigrants were in Brazil in the year 1870. This brings to our key element numero dois, railway engineers of British origin working in Brazil. On one hand, Brazil, the fifth largest country in the world, with a need to connect provincial capitals with each other, and on the other, British railway engineers, the most sought after railway engineers in the world. In the 1870s, like many other British workers in Brazil, a Scottish expatriate named John Miller worked on the railroad construction project in Sao Paulo with other European immigrants. In 1884, Miller sent his 10-year-old son, Charles William Miller, to England for education. A skilled athlete, Charles quickly picked up the game of football at a time when football league was still being formed in England. An accomplished winger and striker, Charles held school honours that gained him entry into the Southampton Football Club and later into the county team of Hampshire. At around the same time, in 1888, with their numbers and influence increasing, the British community in Sao Paulo founded the first sports club in the city, the Sao Paulo Athletic Club, roughly 20 years after the British community in Argentina could do so. Those British residents used to play, well, you know what they used to play. On his return to Brazil, Charles William Miller brought some football equipment and a football association rule book with him. He then taught rules of the game to players in Sao Paulo. Simultaneously, during the same period, another Scottish expat named Thomas Donahoe organized a football game in a neighborhood of Rio de Janeiro. This was six months prior to that of Miller's team in Sao Paulo. However, as it proved in the following years, Miller's contribution was much more than bringing a football and a rule book to Brazil. For this reason, he is widely considered as the father of Brazilian football. On December 14, 1901, the Liga Paulista the Football was founded. Paulista meaning a person from Sao Paulo organizing its own championship, Campeonato Paulista, first held in 1902. The Sao Paulo Athletic Club and Miller a member at the club himself were the founding members. This is the oldest official competition of not only Sao Paulo but also Brazil. Charles Miller kept a strong bond with English football throughout his life. After a tour of English team Corinthians to foot Brazil in 1910, a local club in Sao Paulo, Corinthians was established the same year, taking on the name of the British side after a suggestion from Miller himself. The club still exists today, playing in the top flight. Other well-known football clubs that exist today such as Santos and Flamengo were established during the same period. Due to historical peculiarities and a large geographical size of the country, Brazil had to wait for another 60 years to have a nationwide football competition of their own. It was only in 1959 that with the advancements in civil aviation and air transport that the Brasileiro Serie A, which is now the most watched league in the Americas, could be founded. The Brazilian Football Confederation the governing body of football in Brazil, better known by its acronym, the famous CBF that we see on the Brazilian jersey today, was founded in 1914. As we saw earlier, the oldest football league in Brazil was founded in 1901. However, this was 10 years after the Argentines began theirs, which is a considerable head start. So how did Brazil got up with the Argentines and how did Brazil win their first Copa America, the South American Intercontinental Championship? Before the Argentines could, the answer to that is our key element numero tres, the Italians and Portuguese takeover. No surprises there as we saw in case of Argentina too. Although the continent itself is named after an Italian, Italy had no colonies on the continent at any point of time. Having said that, the Italian influence on the continent in the 20th century cannot be denied, especially when it comes to Latin America. Let it be local culture, politics or sports, Italians who immigrated to the continent played a huge part. After the economic crisis of 1870s, millions of Italians left Italy to find a better life in the Americas. Many among them made their way to Brazil. Between the years 1880 and 1900, over 1 million Italians immigrated to Brazil. This can be partly attributed to factors such as the abolishment of slavery in Brazil in 1888, the military coup which abolished the Brazilian monarchy in 1889, which prompted the formation of the first Brazilian Republic, etc. The Brazilian Republic, as did the empire before them focused on the occupation of the provinces of southern Brazil 
for the new arrivals from Europe. But rather than forming their own segregated neighborhoods like the Little Italy's of New York, Boston or Chicago, the Italians smoothly integrated into these Latino societies. The reason is Portuguese language is much closer to its own language families, that is Latin, as compared to the members of the Germanic language families such as German and English. Therefore, it's much easier for an Italian to learn Portuguese. Moreover, Brazil, as the rest of Latin America, was and still is Catholic. So that helps. So rather than creating their own ethnic neighborhoods, many new Italian immigrants very often married the native-born men or women in Brazil, who could have been of Portuguese, Spanish, French or multiracial heritage. 15% of the Brazilian population today has some degree of Italian ancestry, making it the second largest European component after Portuguese in the country. The Brits did their part by laying the foundation of football in Brazil. But it was arguably the Italian immigrants and the people of Portuguese origin already living there who took it to the next level. This was partly due to the success of earlier version of Serie A or the Italian regional championship back home in Italy, as well as the fact that football was slowly becoming popular in Portugal too. The Italians along with the Portuguese in Brazil not only took to football but also started to boss the game in no time. So much that when Brazil played the first World Cup in 1930, their national side was comprised mostly of these two immigrant populations. Moreover, the Italian World Cup winning squad of 1934 comprised of two Brazilian nationals. This brings to a key element numero quatro, racial mobilization in Brazil. Race appears as a prominent issue while discussing football in Brazil. At the end of the 19th century, football was introduced in Brazil as a European sport that exclusively favored white males with social and economic privileges. Throughout the early 20th century, racial exclusivity continued to exist. During the 1930s, Getulio Vargas, the then president, issued policies that promoted nationalism across the nation, in which football served as an effective tool in unifying the people of Brazil as a single race. This allowed the Brazilian national team to compete in international games overseas, represented by its best players regardless of their backgrounds. This set the precedent for many non-white soccer players from the working class to demonstrate their football skills and talents at publicly recognized games. Unfortunately, football clubs in Brazil were still organized and managed by privileged white administrators with wealthy backgrounds who still encouraged exclusivity among participants during the 1930s and 1940s. The population of Brazil in the year 1940 stood at 41 million, with 65% of them were whites, 10% blacks, 22% of them of mixed race, whereas the indigenous population making up the rest. And this is how it is now. For non-white football players, their social privilege and acknowledgement acquired through football allowed them to practice racial mobility despite their original heritage. However, professionalization of football in the early 20th century strictly prioritized individuals with affluent backgrounds. Thus, non-white football players, after ascending their socio-economic status, were accustomed to an exclusive environment in which the members were politically, socially and economically influential, a fairy tale story of their own and to the millions they inspire. Few chose not to categorize themselves as non-white anymore, but rather preferred to be identified as white because it was the color that was traditionally accepted by the Brazilian elites. Few modern stars, for example, Roberto Carlos, Ronaldo and Neymar refused to be racially identified as black but rather as white. Racial minorities in Brazil tend to undergo upward mobilization to segregate themselves from underprivileged and underdeveloped environment. Football stars in this context showed similar process which they prefer to be identified as powerful figures through categorizing themselves as white. We are not saying Brazil is unique in that sense, but given its population today, which stands at over 200 million, the largest in Latin America, it's the country that manifests this trend in football the most. This brings to a key element numero cinco, Brazil's national team journey. The first game of the Brazil national team was a 1940 friendly between a Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo select team and the English club Extra City held in Fluminense Stadium, Rio de Janeiro. This was followed by a string of friendlies with neighboring Chile, Argentina and Uruguay. In contrast to its future success, Brazil's early appearances were not brilliant. However, in the first half of the 20th century, they did manage to win three Copa Americas, the first among them in 1919, two years before their arch rivals Argentina. They have gone on to win the competition for a total of nine times. Brazil remains the only team to have qualified for all the World Cup editions. This December in Qatar, they will be playing in their 22nd World Cup, winning 5 amongst them, the most among all. They remain the only team to win the World Cup on 4 different continents, a record which will be hard to beat. 
However, let it be the three World Cup wins during Pele and Garincha's era or the two they won later on, most among us would agree Brazil's international watershed moment came in the year 1950 when they hosted their first World Cup. Many, however, don't know that the game that's part of football folklore now, Uruguay beating Brazil at the Maracana, Brazil only required a draw as the game was not exactly the final. Unlike in other editions of the tournament which conclude with a one-off final, the 1950 winner was determined by a final group stage where four teams played in a round-robin format. Brazil missed out by the barest of margins. The game left a scar on the Brazilian psyche. Nevertheless, there was an upside to it, as after this loss, the Brazilian team abandoned their all-white team colors with the yellow, blue and green of the national flag that we are accustomed to now. 20 years on in Mexico 1970, Brazil lifted the Jules Rimet trophy for the third time, the first nation to do so, which meant that they were allowed to keep it, as had been stipulated at the time of the World Cup's inception in 1930. A replacement was then commissioned the current FIFA World Cup trophy, though it would be 24 years before Brazil next won it. The country of Brazil is synonymous with football itself. It's not only a popular sport in Brazil, but also a prominent part of its national identity. Many footballers have gone on to become global superstars from their humble beginnings in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro or Sao Paulo. From their World Cup wins and enthralling everyone with their football skills to Pele, Gorincha, Ronaldo and Neymar becoming household names, Brazil is a true powerhouse of the football world. So that wraps up this segment. Hope you liked it. We are not going to talk much about the recent history as it's already part of football folklore and you guys definitely know more about it than we do. Do you reckon Brazil could add a sixth star here this December in Qatar? Let us know in the comments below if we missed out on something about Brazilian football that we couldn't cram in this video. We're going to talk about one footballing powerhouse every episode, deep diving into their footballing history, learn about how football became so popular out there and what India can do to replicate their success one day at the world stage.